Thanks very much, Ed. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for coming by. I know it's a busy time. Um, so I thought we have a limited amount of time. I thought I would introduce my historical trajectory and some of my concerns and then uh, show some videotapes of, of three selected projects and then pretty much throw the floor open to questions for the, for the rest of the period. Um, yeah, I have, a, um, I have a strange kind of a history. Uh, my formal training is in, in the arts, in sculpture, in fact. Um, and uh, I was building installation work and, and kinetic sculpture um, when I finished art college. Um, moved quickly in, into um, electronically articulated, sensor-driven installation work through the 80s where I was... Um, that, that required me to, to teach myself electronics and learn um, basic process control uh, circuit design um, in order to, to synchronize sensor technologies with, with output devices of different types cobbled together um, from what was available. Um, and um, at the end of the uh, 80s, I, I moved to the United States. And after a short stint at University of Florida, I uh, was offered a position at Carnegie Mellon as, a, as the professor of art and robotics, um, which was a fantastic opportunity in many ways. Um, what, what was clear to me at that point was that I already had the best part of 10 years' experience dealing with the problematics of designing interactivity, uh, both from a conceptual and aesthetic point of view and also from a technical point of view, uh, prior to the, the popularization of the desktop computer and, and desktop multimedia. Uh, that put me at a huge advantage, I think because my conception of what interactivity was and my conception of the aesthetics of interactivity was not constrained by the, the, this particular form of the commodity device which was landing on everybody's desktops at the time. And so that leads me, I think, to one of the most important ideas which has propelled me uh, through my work, um, informed by the kind of openness of the intellectual inquiry in the arts in which I was trained, my approach to technology uh, was not um, look at this tool slash device slash toy, what can I do with it, but what confirmation of technology would m m optimally support the goals, that I, the aesthetic and conceptual goals that I have. Um, and it seems to me that the large, uh, particularly in, in, through the 90s in the period of, of um, uh, uh, computer technology being increasingly commodity technology, where both the hardware and the software was prepackaged and uh, available at the local computer store, it seemed to me that the range of uh, creative possibilities that were available if one remained constrained by those paradigms was quite closed. And it's a kind of Godelian, Godelian world. You know, it's a closed logical realm and you work within that logical realm and all kinds of wonderful things can be done within that logical realm, but there is a vast infinity outside of that um, as opposed to a small infinity. <laughs> in any case, um, what I became really motivated by was, um, and I think this has become increasingly clear to me as a focus of my research over the past 10 years, but uh, um, through the 90s, um, along with my experience in interactivity, I had a a, a, a deep and long involvement with the shaping of experiences, spatialized experiences for embodied engagement. 
right? That is sculpture, installation, performance, kinetic sculpture. Um, and so as a practitioner, as someone who worked those media and as someone whose aesthetic design intentions were focused on building experiences in that realm for people, um, the, the reality of embodied intelligences for me was unquestionable. Um, and I moved, particularly when I moved to Carnegie Mellon, I moved into a context where um, notions of, uh, of cognition and self were highly constrained by a kind of computationalist um, neo-Cartesianism. That's interesting. So I, I found myself dealing, uh, making a kind of critical analysis of the kinds, of, of the ways that the, the mindset of artificial intelligence um, uh, informed the kinds of technologies and the kinds of projects which were, which were being done at the time. And, and my work uh, was often, at least in part, a, a, a kind of physically, experientially manifested critique of those approaches. Um, that's one way to put, put them. Um, so I think, having said that, I, it's best that I show you some of those things. And I seem to have, the, the machine seems to have, um, maybe my computer went to sleep. OK, I now have audio but no video. Yes, OK, that'll, that's good, very nice. So as you can see, this device is, is assembled pretty much out of junk. A lot of it was from the um, from, uh, surplus uh, facilities. Um, but I think it's a case in point of, of um, kind of opening out the design space by, by not asking the question, what can I do with this stuff, but asking the question, um, what kind of a thing will, can I build that will really address my concerns um, most eloquently? Um, so all kinds of decisions about physical dynamics and, and physical scale um, uh, were made based, based on, on that. There's a lot of engineering pragmatics in there as well. Um, and, and again, you know, this, at the time I started building this robot actually in, the, in, in, in 1990, um, and it was first shown in 95 as a functioning device, and continued to be shown through most of the 90s. Um, the the ultra, ultrasonic sensors are the, the well-known Polaroid 
ultrasonic transducers, the, the pyroelectric sensors I essentially built from raw components. And um, the, the whole device is running on a single uh, Motorola uh, 68HC11 microprocessor running at 2 megahertz with, uh, I, as I recall, 128K of RAM. So, no? Well, all right then, thanks for the clarification. It's a long time ago, <laughs> but I do remember that the, when, I, when I had to rebuild it in 2005 for a couple of shows, most of the comp components were obsolete, and the compiler for the microcontroller board I was using was on a five and a quarter inch floppy disk. <laughs> In any case, this, this device was designed expressly with, with the intent of building something that was more or less in the human scale range, which interacted with people according to their already well-known codes of, of personal space and, and bodily behavior. And of course, what's um, as interesting as anything else about it is the way that people are willing to be trained by their, because of their desire to engage with it. Uh, and it's interesting that there's only one demographic that, that were resistant to that, and that was adolescents. So kids and, and adults uh, more or less immediately gauged the pace of behavior of the robot and shaped their behavior to match the robot's behavior so that they extracted the maximum amount of pleasure. Out of the thing, adolescents got bored and disappeared really quickly. <laughs> of the interactive behavior we're seeing there is a result of its natural dynamics and how much of it is intentional in the coding. So for instance, it has this behavior of thrusting itself forward. That's, that's entirely hardware. That's entirely mechanical. There's, there, there's, there's no motor control of that behavior. That's all about the double pendulum structure. And, it, you know, that was interesting. I mean, that's an interesting case of the evolution of the design because that's what I meant about those engineering pragmatics actually opening a realm of expressive or effective potential in the device. So I decided that, that a, a, a two-wheeled device would be the easiest to control and code because I simply have had two DC motors whose control was essentially symmetrical to affect all drive and steering. Um, <clears throat> so I designed a counterweighted device which would, which would make that possible. Um, but then I had the problem that the sensors were um, swinging around erratically, and of course I got no useful sensor data. So the, the simplest solution to that was to, was to have an internal balancing uh, pendulum structure, which of course introduced you know, it's <laughs> classically unpredictable behavior, but I didn't care. But as, as, as a result, I got stable enough sensor data and at the same time, it introduced that whole expressive dimension to, to its dynamics. So I think I'll just go straight to a couple of other pieces. Um, of course, the, the problem with building machines is every time you want to change the behavior, you've got to go through a whole new building process. And, 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 you know, making machines is hard work. Um, so in my work, I've, I've vacillated somewhat between the more sculpturally, robotically instantiated projects and the more virtual projects. I had uh, more image-based projects. And I had a, a, a 
um, a principled reason for doing this when I first started, and that was that um, a, um, a lot of my uh, sort of critical inquiry in the early 90s was into the rhetoric, or the rhetoric around virtuality. Um, and, and of course, I'd, I'd experienced and, and uh, various kinds of so-called VR technologies, including the, the classic iPhones and the, and the cave. I don't know how many people have actually been in a cave. Oh, it's good. That's good. That's more, yeah. So, so you'll remember that that they were. Uh, you no, know, I regard them as the kind of brontosaurus of of media technologies. Um, and and uh, there was a lot. Apart from the complexities of the technology, there was a lot of uh, rhetoric around the embodying nature of the technology. Um, and, and at the time, I felt that that rhetoric was misplaced because although the technology produced a, a, a kind of wraparound stereoscopic uh, visual experience, the user themselves was generally reduced to a single XYZ point in the space. And, and so what I was... Um, uh, what I, what I felt was necessary in order to make the input and output realms of the technology symmetrical was to produce a, a, a sensor interface to the cave which was responsive to full body gesture. Um, that, that meant at the time building a custom multi-camera 3D machine vision system um, uh, which 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 we did, which I did um, in association with a with a, a collaborator, Andre Bernhardt, um, who was a student at the uh, robotics and real time computing department of Karlsruhe University in Germany at the time. Um, it was also um, I thought so my my critique of interface design. Uh, was piqued, I think, by observing the way that in this space, which was, which had kind of huge techno huge potential for embodiment, um, it, interface design tended to port tools from the desktop into this immersive, embodied, three-dimensional space. And I, I could, nothing was sillier to me than the three D mouse. You know, it was just. I thought it was ridiculous. In fact, I had a joke project in which I wanted to implement a virtual QWERTY keyboard in, in, <laughs> in the cave, <laughs> you know, to make that point. Well, I never did that, but I did this project. And I think it's self-explanatory. What I should say is that the part of the technology which I developed is the multi-camera machine vision system. Um, and it's running on a 166 megahertz Pentium 2. Um, and uh, it's interfacing with the, the cave graphics system, which was one of those, you know, you know vast silicon graphics um, uh, graphics computers, which have since disappeared. Um, what was interesting about the design of 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 the graphics technology was that. For my particular purposes, which was to build a, a, a real-time graphical system, st stereographical system, which, which responded in real time to bodily behavior, um, the, even with this Cadillac of graphics computing at the time, I had to rely on hardware instantiated graphics routines to get the throughput that I needed. So you will see that the graphics appear to be very primitive. And that's because they're the only, you know, simple geometrical forms with simple coloring was all that I could muster out of this silicon graphics machine that I could pass through in real time. Um, secondly, uh, the authoring environments for VR were informed by a very particular, it, it became clear by approaching this project as it were from the outside, um, 
the authoring environments for VR were very constrained also, and um, um, constrained to a paradigm that, that virtual reality was the um, visual navigation of virtual architectural spaces. So it was possible to texture map planes um, and, and, and construct virtual architectural spaces which would um, uh, come into and out of existence based on computational costs with hither and yon clipping and all the rest of that mid-90s graphics language. But in fact, I, I, I was unable to use those authoring environments because there was very little in them that didn't pertain specifically to, to movement of a viewpoint through a virtual space. And in this project, although I'm using a cave, there's no virtual architecture and there's no navigation per se. So having said that, I'll, I'll play the tape, uh, play the, um, the disc. Well, I thought I would. Okay.
it's, um, it's difficult to document these sort of projects at the best of times. And, uh, so hopefully that, that documentation gives you some idea of the behavior of the system. Now, if I can get back to the menu. Ah, oh, look at that, I found the menu. Okay, so the, the Traces project um, is, is a case of, the, of the, that uh, utilization of the, that, well, in, in fact, I built the, the 3D vision system specifically for that project. Uh, later on, I went on to use it in a rather different way in another project. Um, the, I, in fact, used uh, uh, a single cam custom single camera machine vision system for the first iteration of the Fugitive Project. But I'll show you the, the later iteration of the project, which I think is um, fairly self-explanatory. seating and two screens. One screen provides live video feed from the system, as seen by the user. The other provides a real-time volumetric rendering of the user in the interaction space, derived from the infrared vision system. The user enters the interaction space via a darkened corridor. Light control is critical to the functioning of the system. When the user moves about the space, the image responds instantaneously by changes in its physical position on the wall, generally remaining diametrically opposite the user. But if the user comes too close to the image, it runs away. The action takes place in a 9 meter or 30 foot diameter circular room. Inside the space, mounted overhead, are 12 infrared floodlights, four video cameras, and a video projector suspended from a motion control rig. Adjacent to the interaction space is a control room containing two PCs running the vision system, the video database system, and real-time 3D rendering. The heart of Fugitive 2 is the multi-camera machine vision system. This system constructs a real-time 3D model of the user in the interaction space derived from the four camera images. All behavior of Fugitive is based on information from this system. Acceleration, velocity, angular movement of the user and other parameters are extracted from the vision system data. Specific values for these parameters trigger entry into and exit out of specific locations in specific video clips. The video database contains over an hour of video encoded as motion JPEG. 
There are nine locations and a total of 437 shots. Each location is captured as full circle pans and zoom shots for every sector. There are generally 24 zooms or one for every 15 degrees of rotation. Each zoom shot is indexed to a specific keyframe on the pan so that the transition from pan to zoom and vice versa is coherent. When the user moves around the room in an orbital circular path, they trigger a pan shot. As they continue to move on such a path, sequential frames of the pan are presented across the wall as if a virtual window was moving across the wall. If the user moves radially towards the image, a zoom sequence of the view from that point in the pan is shown. In all cases, the frame rate of the video is proportional to the user's velocity. It's very important to me that as a user of Fugitive, you can walk in, you don't need to read the manual, you don't need to do the tutorial, you don't need any special training, you don't have to strap on any special gear, you're not tethered by a cable, and you don't have to learn some symbolic language on some kind of input device. You walk in, you use the skills that you have developed in interacting with the world, and it works that way. In that way, it fits into my conception of what we have to do as artist researchers. The current technological context, as I see it, is that we have, for the first time, a technology which we can exploit to build cultural artifacts which have behavior. That has never happened before. It's not been possible to build cultural artifacts which respond to their environment before. The original Fugitive Project was begun in 1995 at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, USA and was completed at the ZKM in Karlsruhe, Germany in 1997. The goal was to build a system with rich and diverse behaviour which interpreted and responded to large physical movement and gesture. At the time, machine vision was a new and active research area at the cutting edge of robotics, made possible by increases in available computational power. The notion of an artwork that utilised analysis of real-time video as a source for sensing and interpreting a behaviour was rare. All the code and all the machinery for Fugitive was custom made. It is a testament to the rapid change in digital technologies that similar machine vision systems are now available as interfaces to desktop games. It's, it's amazing. I mean, one would think this is random. How, how can it be more random? No, they can still extract information. It's my colleague Andre there. Okay, so I think we can stop there. <clears throat> um, can kill that. So pleased to. Um, I think I'll cut the master volume here because it's kind of noisy. If I can. Here we go. All right. So, um, I think we have um, almost 10 minutes or maybe 15 minutes maximum for questions. So I'll be pleased to discuss. Oh. Uh, look, I, actually, I've just been writing a paper that addresses that subject, um, and it's it's disastrous. Um, I, I think that we've essentially lost the history of media art research from the late 80s 
through to the early years of this decade. Um, because it was built on so many uh, platforms which were in rapid change, um, it's not possible to resurrect the platforms. In many cases, it's not possible to even extract the data from the media that, that it was stored on. Uh, and, and a lot, you know, there, but there's a, there's, a, there's a deeper issue in that, in the history of that period of media art research, of which I, you know, these works clearly fit into, um, which I think is a, a, a really deep problem in, 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 in art history, if we think of it from the point of view of art history. And that is that when the technology first started to become available in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, that small community of artists and, and uh, experimenters who wanted to engage the cultural potential of the new technology were concerned at the first instance with grasping the formal language. And the formal language was, of course, designed, uh, defined by the available technology. But so that this was a period of what I call, well, what did I call it? I called it something or another, um, uh, uh, media formalism. You know, there was um, <clears throat> an explicit desire to to characterise modalities of interaction, uh, relationships between projected imagery and, 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 and interactive behaviour in the arts as, as well as in other areas. Um, but as these systems, both conceptually and technically, chunked up, the very, those very kind of elemental formal relationships were subsumed into more complex systems, which makes the work almost impossible to understand if you don't have a firm grounding in the technological capability of the technology at the time. It makes it incomprehensible, you know? So, so I think the work is largely lost um, because of both those reasons. If I was to build Fugitive 3, how would I do it today? Um, Um, well, it's a question of whether the system as built would still engage people or not. And I'm, I'm, I, I believe that, that what it is that engages people, at least, well, actually with all of the works that I, I, I've shown you today, is this, this bodily engagement. I mean, what, what, what I enjoy about my work is hearing people burst into spontaneous laughter while stomping around, you know, and then emerging sweating and panting. You know, I think that's unusual for, for digital art forms. And, and, and so I, I think that there's still novelty in that. And in a sense, that's, that's an indication of a whole territory that is not yet well explored because it, it is novel. And I certainly would, I mean, as you've probably noticed, I did not say this, but I've never made a work which had a screen or a keyboard or a mouse. And I will absolutely not do it, you know, because I'm interested in, 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 in I'm, I mean, I think what's become, you know, one does things and one explores things and slowly it becomes clear to one what, what one is actually addressing or, or, or concerned with. And for me, increasingly, what I'm concerned with is, is our nature as embodied intelligences. And, and this is where the kind of core of my critique of the AI and computationalist methodologies uh, sort of comes home to roost. Is, it, there is that 
to the extent that we adhere to those notions, we render invisible uh, what I would say is the, the larger part of human intelligence, which is our ability to, um, in a multimodal and contingent way, engage with a changing world. You know, we, those qualities uh, are, to me, aspects of intelligence which are which are fundamental to different aspects of the arts, but yet largely fall outside the conventional definitions of intelligence within the technical community. Now, I know I'm generalizing wildly here, and I certainly don't mean to offend anybody in this room or anybody anywhere else, but, um, you know, so, so the, the, you know the, the core of my concern at the moment on a theoretical level is, is precisely negotiating those aspects of being which have which clearly characterize our intelligent being in the world um, and and our fundamental qualities of cultural practices you know and and so the challenge is in a way to deploy these technologies which have been conformed according to a different model of self and world to 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 build an experience which addresses those things. Like for instance, in Fugitive, you know, one of the kind of underlying preoccupations with Fugitive was, was to critique one of the paradigms of, of navigation in the virtual world, which was that in a, in a kind of conventional immersive VR environment, it's the, it's the world which is static and fixed and, uh, and uh, um, conforms to a notion of objectivity. And the viewpoint is the flexible, subjective, error-prone part. You know, there's a, there's a continuous virtual architectonic space which, which has the stability of rock or appears to, you know. And, and what I wanted to do in Fugitive was to turn that on its head so that the user was constantly reflecting on the continuity of their embodiment. The temporal gestural flow of embodiment and the representations themselves were kind of fractured and would jump. Because I didn't want, you know, it was, it was, it was a paradoxical project, right? Because I didn't want people to fixate on the image, you know? So there's a kind of double thing, there's a triple thing going on. There's the system as agent, there's the, the, there's the screenal representation as quasi-movie, and there's the focus on the continuity of embodiment of the user. And hopefully, what if someone thinks about their experience in the space, they, th they think about the relationship between those three parts. But it was very problematic to design the image content for the piece because I wanted the imagery to be boring. <laughs> and yet not too boring, right? Because, because had, had, had I simply generated real-time text that said, you are now running towards the image, right, when you were, or whatever, that would have been just profoundly literal. So, so I wanted to do something that, that, that captured in a kind of analogic, poetic way the idea that the system understood the dynamics of the person without having them fixate on the image as telling some kind of a story. I'll ridicule you if you are. <laughs> but, um, in the last video, you were talking about how this new technology as a sign was being used to, um, to create these new forms of art. Is there any new technologies now that you see coming in the future that haven't been used in, in art or you know, digital art yet or you know, art and science yet, and that you see having great potential to be able to create these new forms of art? Um, is there any new technologies that you see coming? 
Yeah, well, you know, given that I'm concerned a lot with, with um, being in the world, you know, there's a lot of non-visual, non-acoustic, non-laptop-based technologies that I, 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 I think have a lot of potential. I know there are a number of people working on, on GPS wireless-based art practices, which I think are very interesting. Things related to geocaching um, or, or things related to the integration of, of, um, of, uh, of geographical and demographic and uh, other kinds of data specific to one's geographical location as one moves about the world. I have a uh, student who's, who worked on a project like this at one point which sort of overlaid one's movement through the world with, with demographic and geographical information by integrating GPS and, and, and wireless. Um, I think that's interesting. I think that, um, I think that uh, you know, the, some of the new miniaturized accelerometer and, and gyroscope technology uh, and a lot of the kind of increasingly miniaturized wireless technology is, is, has huge potential for doing things which fall outside of conventional art practices. You know, and I think that's really interesting. There's a lot of sort of locative, so-called locative media practice going on now and I think that's a, a very important sort of new realm to explore. Um, but, but for me it's the it's the paradigms which require the most work, you know? I mean, in a lot of cases, I felt it necessary to essentially build my own technology um, because I had a certain goal. And I think what's quite problematic at the moment is that there, there is so much easily accessible and easily compatible technological units that they proscribe the, at least to a kind of a um, less seasoned experimenter. The fact that they proscribe the realm in which you can work is invisible or, or sort of remains unimportant. You know, so I always want to ask, what's outside the envelope? What is it that, that this technology is not letting me do? You know? And, and, and how can I conceive of a technology that does something that, techn that we don't have technological tools to do right now? We better, uh, thanks, oh, we have to wrap it up? I'm sorry. Oh, oh I see there's a cure. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank you.